I must start with the nearly all trade routes to the east need to go through the eastern Baltic states. And the um, situation changed um, quite abruptly uh, in the 7th, 8th century when the sail was invented in the Baltic Sea. I don't still believe it was invented this time. And um, uh, which made it available to sail over the open sea, which definitely was done before, but not so often. Uh, so the routes, uh, it's very rough plan. I'm only talking about uh, the international most important routes, not all routes that we used. Uh, so that, firstly, uh, the first, one of the first signs of uh, the big <coughs> discovery for the Eastern Baltic we can see in Kruabin, and it has been mentioned several times. And uh, I just want to emphasize here that Kruabin was there before and was there after the Scandinavian colony. Uh, the Scandinavian colony was there only from 650 up to 850 and no more. And we know only cemeteries, the proper training place has not been found um, as much as we know. Uh, and um, again, these three Scandinavian cemeteries excavated, but around there are Koronian cemeteries, quite a number of them, so it wasn't entirely Scandinavian, it also was very much local. So the Koronian's location has been discussed by several of you here, I just want to say a few words. So there is no trading routes towards the east, starting from, from Kruabinia, there is just one small river. So it, it is very difficult to connect it topographically with the eastern way, with the ways towards the east. So when sailing to the east, to the big Austrian or the eastern way, you normally uh, used the uh, Finnish Bay up in the north, uh, we'll show it closer later, and uh, that would only be a big tour to, to say to grow up in after that. On the other hand, when coming from central Sweden or Gotland and heading to the Vistula River, where we are here now, then actually right after uh, sailing over the open sea, the one and only, nearly only, uh, naturally suitable harbour site along the very straight colonial uh, coast is mainly where Croatia is a small lagoon and a proper place to land. Uh, so the, approximately in the same time when Croatia um, was abandoned by Scandinavians, the latest uh, 850, uh, we think it, it seems at least that the Scandinavians somehow lost their interest, or well, we don't know. Uh, then, approximately uh, in the same time or after that, there appeared these two new centers that are uh, now. And uh, I also want to point that this area of uh, um, where is Kauptuso and also Kropia in Kunen. Uh, it is actually the Baltic area. It is actually the old Amur route that had existed long, long before. When we talk about the Viking movement there, uh, it's just the Scandinavians taking over the network that already existed, and uh, I think it was greatly, at least in this part of the world, based on the language similarity of the boards. So the communication in the south and north of the eastern Baltic, where these places are, uh, was characterized by some very specific features I want to emphasize. So except the nearest vicinity of these colonies, these graves, these cemeteries that you have pointed here several times, the Scandinavian influence is not very strong. It's actually very little. So that only few Scandinavian artifacts have been found outside the nearest vicinity. And uh, the local culture just continued individually. And I want to call to uh, British anthropological archaeologist Chris Gosson, who has discussed the different modes of communication and colonization, what he calls it. And one of them is called middle ground. 
And I think it fits perfectly for the Corvinia and for the Trusor case. It's uh, characterized by few separate colonies, but very little operation in the surrounding areas. And what is very important, I mean, these colonies uh, and all this way of communication includes socially complex immigration, which means that people from different social strata move over, which also means that both men and women move over. So uh, my imagination of the meaning of Kroobinen is actually so here. So uh, after approximating the beginning or the first half of the ninth century, it seems that the Viking or Scandinavian uh, interest turned more towards the east, because this is actually south. And so the east is the Austrian When you really want to sail or go <coughs> to uh, the Volga rivers, where most of the deal comes anyway, came in. So you actually the absolutely best way is to choose the uh, the Finnish Bay and the, the route along this. These green dots you re realize already. These are deer farm finds, and these notice how how many deer farms have been found in different Baltic states. So there is a huge difference when we compare the Baltic states. Along this road. There are also centers, I will not talk more about them or very much about them. There are several hill forts with large settlements next to them along the North Estonian coast. It's a good Arab lands, proper harbor places, and, and then these centers. Uh, but the most prominent of them was Iru, uh, seven kilometers from the present day Tallinn. There is a picture of it. And, uh, it appeared in the 6th century. So nowadays, at least I uh, interpret it as aristocratic residence, where probably some people stayed year around, but I also believe that seasonally uh, the population of this site increased several times when the sea was open and uh, all kind of communication was going on. Uh, in this aspect, Iru, the beginning of Iru resembles Helia and not so much Pirta. Uh, Helia, which appeared in the 5th century already, and which by Doug Hintz here also has been and nowadays interpreted as aristocratic residence. And, uh, but but uh, again, this was before the great boom that brought in all these deer farms into one uh, cream. And we can only believe, um, and I'm absolutely not the first one to claim it, that the uh, uh, Austrobaker before the real Viking age was based on fur trade and was greatly based on um, language similarity between the Baltic Finns and the Minorian languages which were talked around the years, uh, around the rivers uh, Volga and Kama further east. And so Scandinavians were actually again taking it over. Uh, what kind of ecological evidence do we have of it? Um, we have, uh, this is uh, borrowed from Finland because it's nice, <laughs> but, uh, but we have uh, especially the spent fish in the Thermic area uh, for the east, and uh, uh, they have been found in Finland, but also in Estonia, and they normally belong to the period before the Viking Age. But we also have artifacts from the west before the Viking Age, and I think this is quite meaningful map as well. These are the luxurious artifacts we have. And uh, please notice again, they have been found in Estonia, or especially North Estonia, uh, the root wars, then Saarema, and then around Kruabinia, and almost nothing in the rest of the Eastern Baltic. Uh, some best finds of them is from Prosa, a present day Tallinn, very close to the Euro center, um, probably originating from the southern Scandinavia in the 6th century, but found in a very local stone grave, so nothing tells us that this particular person was Scandinavia. It's much more likely it was a local chieftain who somehow had close contacts with Scandinavia. But also, I 
can't do that. <laughs> the paper is sun, and fine. Uh, and um, I can see it. It's um, like um, location connected to the road uh, over the sea from Gotland. When, uh, when you do this route, as I show here, then uh, and adhering to the Finnish Bay, then actually it's the best way to sail through a strait which existed between uh, the big island, I mean right here, the big island and the small island of Sandbank. And there I have suspected a harbor site that uh, has not been found yet, but what they have found is two boat burials right in the place of a possible harbor site. And our interpretation, I don't have too much time to talk about. Uh, my interpretation is a little bit different than um, uh, Yuri Bates, who excavated it. Here you can see uh, the boat number, uh, ship, sorry, number two, the number two uh, three different faces. You see a burial chamber with all these uh, uh, burials uh, of uh, warriors. And, uh, uh, and uh, I see Sona as a combination of local and Scandinavian. I can see it properly, Scandinavian. And at uh, first of all, what is a local thing is mainly the collective grave. So it's a collective burial place. In this time, Sarama, we don't, uh, I don't believe either that it's necessarily the 8th century. It can easily be, I better believe it's the end of the 7th century. In the 7th century, we have excavated very few graves on Sarama. But, but what we have excavated are burial, uh, burial houses or dead houses. Small huts uh, filled with human bones, completely mixed, probably just new and new burials brought in, but not cremated. So that, like, decayed there or somewhere else. And actually, it's the same here, it was probably considered very proper burial, burial custom by the locals. I believe it was the locals who buried this man. Uh, anyway, um, the weapons, the weapons uh, of these men were Scandinavian, but uh, their weapons so far were just compared with negative evidence. I mean, we had no weapons from Sarah from this time. They just claimed that this is Scandinavians. And there are some new, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> there is a choir of sun mass, as this picture is called, <laughs> in the <laughs> of poetry. But uh, the new find, from the very recent years, actually this picture is taken just uh, a little bit more than a week ago. I was there doing some research. Uh, so 20 kilometers from Sarna, we found another place belonging to the same period. And this is Vidoma, a sacrificial place. And what we found were weapons, like they have sacrificed lots of weapons, lots of uh, uh, jewelry, the weapons are all Salma weapons. They are exactly the same types as I said Salma, with few exceptions uh, which um, resemble Finnish finds. So probably they were the local ones then. But the jewelry is local. Some very few examples. This is some Arab waves, but now uh, just uh, recently we have found quite a number of. Uh, swords and, uh, and spearheads and other things. And what is even more interesting, um, the local uh, jewelry, like typical jewelry for both men and women, but in this context probably warriors, uh, this very local shape, but decorated in early animal styles. So that, um, um, what we can say about it is, but uh, that probably it was some kind of shared culture, a common culture sphere already in the time of the Salma find. Uh, I also have to say that this period, 7th century, was a time when there was a dramatic change in burial customs or all the architectural culture uh, in the coastal Estonia. The earlier Baltic and Prussian influences suddenly disappeared and were replaced by Scandinavian influences and very strong Scandinavian influences. And uh, on Sarama, it even reached so far that they, sometime, approximately the same time, they abandoned 
the old day houses with collected burials and instead started to bury in what we call stone circle graves, cremations, individual cremations, and exactly the same grave form that we know from Gotland, where it appeared approximately in the same time. <coughs> I need to say uh, that there is a serious methodological problem in Estonia because from the period from the 7th up to the mid 10th century, we almost do not have graves. So they buried in some way, which, I don't know, today once appeared. So we don't have graves. But we have all these settlements, we have all these uh, hill forts with very intensive uh, music layer, and we also have these stillman finds. Again, a bit um, closer picture. So, and uh, as you see, the Dilfan finds actually are, they are really very numerous in, in Estonia, and then they kind of mark uh, the most important communication routes. So when we now, we have this empty period, I mean, like empty of, of graves, which means that we have very few artifacts, because most of archaeological artifacts anyhow come from graves. So we have very few of them, and therefore it has Salma and Vino have been top interesting. But when we get the picture again, and that is the second half of the 10th century, then in the coastal Estonia, coastal Estonia is slightly different than inland Estonia, or even strongly different. And in the coastal Estonia, we have almost identically Eastern Scandinavian artifacts in maid sphere, or warrior sphere. So the same uh, weapon types, the same belt fittings, uh, similar jewelry as in Gotland, for instance, are uh, just few examples here. But <coughs> at the same time, the Tuesday <coughs> sphere remained very low. So that's it's a solely for warriors. So more pictures. Again, none of us probably is expert, but uh, some recent studies in Estonia have, have uh, demonstrated that at least part of these pictures, that they are very local derivations that we completely adopted not only the all kind of main attributes as such, but we also had completely adopted the, uh, the animal art from Scandinavia, and we developed it further so that we have variants which doesn't occur anywhere else. They're very clearly locally made. And this is, it's very approximate, <coughs> but approximately, uh, where is this area where this warrior sphere is uh, characterized with nearly identical uh, artifacts? And uh, back to Chris Coston again, there is actually another category by him, and that's called the Shia Culture Sphere, and that's exactly what I see in the northern part of the Eastern Baltic. And that's as he also says, and I agree, it's very difficult to see, so to say, in the archaeological material, because some foreign cultural norms have been taken over. And uh, they have been completely taken over, but normally only by elite, so that not, not, not by the commoners, or in, uh, in our case, by women. It's very pointedly called colonies without colonies. There is no Viking colonies found neither in Estonia nor in Finland. And uh, it also includes some more of some people, certainly, but uh, not a complex immigration. We can presume that warriors, some warriors moved over, some merchants moved over, some of them stayed, some of them left, but it wasn't a complex immigration, as we see in Krovin, or also here in, in Shusu. And here is just like the two completely different modes of communication, as I see it in the eastern coast of the Baltic Sea. Um, the boom, the great mountain age boom, bringing in dirhams, it stopped, you know, you all know, it stopped in the end of the 10th century or the beginning of the 11th century. The result was that uh, several centuries were abandoned, nearly all hill forts along the uh, North Estonian coast were abandoned, Iru was abandoned, Pirka was abandoned, uh, Staralade was abandoned, and so on, or, or burned down, whatever. And, uh, I see also that there was a change <coughs> in the relevance of trade routes. And from now on, the archaeological material in the Eastern Baltic demonstrates that the most important route going through the Eastern Baltic is the Darwin River. I don't want to say that the other routes 
dropped off huge. No, they were of course used. And uh, and now there is, you know, you see, instead of because there is six you now, instead of star alarm, because there is not corrosion and so on. So there is, of course, there was trade and there was communication and everything. Now it was predominantly communication between the states in Kyrgyz and in Scandinavia countries. So it was different. It differed very much from the Viking bands adventuring in the Far East. Um, the most important central in the starting from the 11th century in this area was definitely Daugmala, a huge complex, um, quite much excavated, almost not published, huge rooms full of material. <laughs> so here is the position of it, but I think the better picture is this one. You see the nature situation in the beginning of, of the river Daugava, so that there is 20 kilometers of land which can't be used for agriculture, and then where the agricultural lands start, there is Daugava with lots and lots of cemeteries around, so that the cemeteries, because this was the Leavik area. Anyhow, the cemeteries uh, around Daugmala, uh, they demonstrate extraordinary big ethnic diversity in female graves. Huge. I think they, they talk uh, of one third up to half of the burials, female burials, being of some other ethnicity, but these. Some pictures, uh, you probably <laughs> don't recognize, but, but, but these different burials, they were Atlantic, they were uh, Middle Swedish, the Semigallian, uh, mainland Esto Estonian, uh, Saarema, and Curonian. <coughs> uh, very few ones yeah, from uh, Latgalia. <laughs> this is some Saarema things. Uh, at the same time, we don't see this diversity in, in male graves, but it's easy to explain. You, you saw this common Martian sphere, <laughs> so that all these women came from areas where the warrior males had more or less the same equipment. So we can't see them. So they all look Livonian. I can also say that we don't have neither uh, Latgalian women and no Latgalian men, because Latgalian men equipment is different than Livonian. The same is true for other ports. Anyway, just uh, to finish uh, uh, the 11th or century, there is also some alternatives. One of them is now the, uh, the famous route from the Varangians to the Creeks. Novgorod now is a big political center. Of course, it makes sense to, to go and visit it. But there are also some others I don't have time or, or intention to talk um, closer about. But you see, the centers of the 11th, 12th century fit pretty well with these routes. There is also the Munas. I don't agree that the Munas was very important because uh, because all the routes now they don't go to the Volga River, they mainly head to Byzantium, and the best way is Tauva, of course, but uh, Nemunas as well, but when coming from the central Sweden, there is no point to, to go down, but coming from uh, Denmark, there is actually, you can turn down or to the river or uh, to the, uh, the Volga River. So just, um, I want to conclude, that uh, the written sources favor the southern half of the Eastern Baltic. I think the archaeological sources favor the northern part of, uh, of the Eastern Baltic when talking about the Viking Age communication. And actually, it's even true for the written sources because the northern half, Estonia and Livonia, has been mentioned, I don't know, definitely more <coughs> times than the southern half. But there are long narratives about the southern half. Half. And uh, I also want to say that now, when the, when the most important destination was Byzantium, we can also see that the Scandinavian influence diminishes very quickly. Now, all the Scandinavian colonies disappear wherever they were. The Scandinavian influence disappears in Estonia or, or the other countries. And, and even the uh, graves in the Libic cemeteries, which were Scandinavian, they were in the 10th century, and in the 11th century, uh, they disappeared already. So that the relevance of different routes have been completely different in different time periods.